The Biden administration is ramping up screening efforts to process people evacuated from Afghanistan as tens of thousands of refugees wait in transit hubs in different parts of the world. Thousands have already arrived in the U.S. The Department of Homeland Security allowed many of them to enter the country without visas on humanitarian grounds. But there are still questions over where these evacuees will end up. For more, I want to bring in Nicole Skanga. Nicole is CBS News Homeland Security and Justice reporter. Hi there, Nicole. So the Pentagon announced Camp Atterbury in Indiana will become the eighth military site on the U.S. mainland to house evacuated at-risk Afghans, including special immigrant visa applicants. How will evacuees be processed at these facilities, and how many does the U.S. anticipate housing? Yeah, Camp Atterbury in Indiana joins a group of military sites participating in this effort. Others are located in places like Virginia, Wisconsin, New Jersey, and New Mexico. U.S. officials say this most recent military installation will be used to house up to 5,000 Afghan evacuees. Meanwhile, U.S. officials are scrambling really to expand their capacity to accommodate up to 50,000 at-risk Afghans. That includes special immigrant visa applicants, by the way, SIVs who aided the U.S war effort during America's longest war. Now, right now, Fort McCoy in Wisconsin can house the most evacuees with a 10,000 person capacity. President Biden, meanwhile, has put the Department of Homeland Security in charge of resettling evacuees at these DOD sites and initiating their immigration proceedings. Also happening at these military bases, evacuees are being tested for COVID-19 and undergoing medical checks. Nonprofit resettlement agencies will also be helping out in this effort working on securing work permits, green cards and travel arrangements for these evacuees. And how will these Afghan refugees be vetted before entering the U.S.? What challenges does law, uh, federal law enforcement face? Yeah, so when they left home, at-risk Afghans able to produce biographic and biometric information were first screened against U.S. databases. And DHS has deployed about 300 personnel, people from CBP, ICE, TSA, and the U.S. Coast Guard, to these so-called so lily pads abroad uh, to support this effort. These are U.S. military bases in places like Bahrain, Germany, Kuwait, Italy, Qatar, Spain, and the United Arab Emirates. And the FBI also has has a presence at a select number of these lily pad sites to help streamline um, some of these biometric and database checks. They determine if derogatory information is discovered before the immigrants travel to the United States. Now, current and former Homeland Security officials I've been speaking with do concede this is a challenging effort. It is, in essence, compressing an 18 to 24 month vetting process with, you know, at times 14 different steps into a much, much much shorter timeline, and there is an inherent risk in processing so many people, you know, some of whom have incomplete documentation in the course of weeks. Well, Nicole, the Department of Homeland Security issued an intelligence assessment to federal, state, and local partners detailing the threat of violent extremists who seek to exploit the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. What more can you tell us about this? Yeah, U.S. officials, Elaine, have actually warned law enforcement partners about a wave of online activity surfaced by white supremacist groups and racially motivated extremists following this relocation of evacuated Afghans to U.S. soil. Um, you know, both white supremacists and anti-government groups purporting the Great Replacement Theory have sprung up online, pushing false claims and prompting concerns of potential violent activities directed at immigrant communities, certain faith communities or the evacuees themselves. Currently, the Department of Homeland Security does lack specific or credible reporting indicating that violent extremists are planning to target specific events. That's important. But refugee advocates that, you know, we talk to uh, more generally are concerned that anti-immigrant sentiment will be begin to rear its head, you know, in cities across the country. Now, we should expect to see efforts not only by the federal government, but also by nonprofit groups and even community members to welcome in these refugees, the vast majority of whom, if not all, remember, have just experienced significant trauma just in making it out of Kabul. Absolutely. Well, next Saturday will be 20 years since 9-11. How do U.S. Homeland Security officials assess the threat today? Is the United States safer than we were two decades ago? 
Yeah, that's the big question we're going to be asking, Elaine. And I, I think the former head of the FBI's post-9-11 counterterrorism mission, John Pistol, put it best when he told me, yes, we're safer, but we're not as safe as we would like to be. And one thing is for sure, Elaine, you know, the nature of the threat has evolved over the past 20 years. The threat of cybersecurity incidents, online disinformation and propaganda, inspired attacks, they've all grown. And there is concern now from U.S. government officials that anti-government or anti-authority extremists may even be inspired by the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. Now, earlier this month, DHS also identified a heightened threat environment ahead of the 20th anniversary of the September 11th terrorist attacks. Uh, they put it in a public memo, and officials cautioned also that extremist groups could exploit the emergence of COVID-19 variants by viewing the reestablishment of public health restrictions across the U.S. as some sort of rationale to conduct attacks. We know that everyone has been inside amid the COVID pandemic, at least most people. We know that, you know, people have been spending a lot of time online. Uh, but what we don't know yet is how that will all play out. And that is what keeps some officials up at night. All right. Uh, Nicole Skanga for us. Nicole, thank you very much. Thank you.